Hi, this is Scott Middle from Insico. I'm the Vice President of Sales here at Insico and I wanted to go into a little bit of education with regards to the different growth techniques of Sapphire. The reason why I want to do this is because these growth techniques provide different benefits and advantages from a cost or a quality basis and sometimes that's important in end use applications. So here in front of me I have an edge defined film fed growth technique. This technique is an extrusion technique and it yields sapphire in an extrusion, uh, commonly used in point of sale industry. So if you're in a supermarket and you're checking out, that's usually a piece of sapphire. And that piece of sapphire on top, because it's so hard, is usually made by the EFG technique. Next we have Shakralski. Very tough word to say, very tough word to spell. A lot of people feel that Shakralski, this is the single crystal silicon version, it's just for sapphire. So here's an example of a two inch diameter piece. Uh, also in talking about the Shakralski technique, you can see that it's core drilled in a specific way. This was in order to get a specific orientation because sapphire is the single crystal version of aluminum oxide. It does exhibit anisotropy. And you can see that anisotropy even in the end face of this part because it's not circular. Additionally, we have a Karopolis technique. In the case of the Karopolis technique, this is a technique again where we are going with a very specific orientation. And then we have heat exchanger method. The heat exchanger method is another technique in which we get very good optical quality material. And this optical quality material can be used for infrared countermeasure devices. We have some parts here that were for left ventricle assist devices. Uh, because sapphire is non-thrombogenic, it's commonly used in some of these applications for in-body use. So if you have some questions with regards to sapphire and what is the appropriate growth technique, these are the techniques that are most readily available that we would be working with in order to try to accommodate making a part for you. Scott, what kind of sapphire does Insico grow? That's a good question. Insico does not grow any sapphire. We have the unique advantage of being able to choose from any of these growth techniques based upon what we understand about the end use to give the best possible material for the end use application. I believe I heard a question that what is the first, how was sapphire grown originally? So sapphire was grown originally in a vernal technique. And a vernal technique, and this is a vernal bowl, what happens is droplets of molten aluminum oxide, which is very hot, 2050 C, are dropping onto this very similar to a stalagmite in a cave. The internal quality of this material is somewhat poor. It might have some low angle grain boundaries and some other issues with regards to transmission, but it's commonly used in watch crystal faces. And so as you look at these materials, there are end use applications for each one of these. From Insico's perspective, it's still sapphire. We can still machine grind and polish it. It's just typically chosen based upon size. So for example, in the case of HEM, the HEM material can be grown quite large, up to 20 inches in diameter. The Sikorsky technique can be grown very long, so we can make very long parts such as sapphire tubes. The sapphire tubes that you see on display here were actually manufactured from Sikorsky poles. If I were designing a high-end optical product, what growth method should I use? Sapphire has Again, is the single crystal version of aluminum oxide. It's a hexagonal rhombohedral structure. And what happens if there's an interruption in the material, you could get a low angle grain boundary. The material which is typically the best is this side of my display, either Coropolis or HEM. And both of these materials yields a very good, high quality material. You can also get into the sapphire transmission characteristics, which are also can be somewhat problematic. For example, what I didn't go into is in the case of the flame fusion process, in order for this process to make a bowl that's actually workable, you typically have to add copious amounts of TiO2 or titanium. When you add that TiO2, that material is machinable and it doesn't fracture, but this can also be the source of supply for the sapphire for the HEM process and you would end up with pink bowls. Pink bowls are TiO2 will restrict the ultraviolet transmission down in the 200 to 300 nanometer range. So again, all of these materials are selected based upon the end use application. So anything that can be given to us with regards to what it's being used for can be somewhat critical in terms of assuring 
the success of Sapphire in the end use application. If I needed a polished part, can you tell us about Insego's polishing capabilities? We have the ability to lap and polish. Uh, polishing we consider to be hitting it with a CMP solution. Lapping would be hitting it with either free abrasive diamond or some other abrasive. We have the ability to polish outside diameters, inside diameters. If we want, we could grab a spherical radius part and put it up here. We could also grab a, a flat part. But we have the ability to grind and polish sapphire to any configuration. It really, we are only restricted or limited by your, the customer's creativity. Why would I choose sapphire over alumina? Because you want to be able to see through it. You could think of sapphire as it's the alumina you can see through. So sapphire will transmit from the ultraviolet to the infrared. That's one of its advantages. That's why it is very commonly used in applications, for example, in LEDs, because it will transmit through the ultraviolet region, through the visible region, and actually into the infrared region. So you can get dual use. But it does have certain transmission characteristics based on its impurities. So when we go to these materials, some of these techniques, for example, in the case of the EFT technique, this is an extrusion process. We have to pull the material through a die. That die is going to impart impurities. We're at 2050C. So at 2050C, we're going to impart impurities into this material, which are going to become evident in the finished part unless you can grind it away. And there are ways to grind, this, grind it away. But all of these materials are very applicable in certain end-use applications, but it does vary. But in terms of the HEM, in terms of the Karopolis, in terms of the Shakralski, in terms of the EFG, in terms of the Vernoul, there's actually even more. There's other techniques as well. And what it comes down to in the case of Sapphire is it's not a material that you choose because you want to. You choose it because you need it because there's no other choice. And that is something to keep in mind as you use these materials because that is the reason why sapphire is chosen. In the instance of these materials, we have the capability to make any part. So any configuration you can think of, we can make. But please keep in mind, the cost is, can be extreme. Because it's extremely difficult to do these because these materials are very hard. We have a machine shop that's about 85,000 square feet with about 300 machine tools. They're all diamond grinding tools. That's all we're using is diamond grinding tools. And that's the only thing that's going to be able to effectively do work on these materials. What are some of the limitations of each of the growth techniques? Mostly it's with regards to the internal quality for transmission characteristics as well as size. You know, so, for example, in the case of the CFG technique, these can be made very big. In terms of the Sikorsky technique, this technique was actually somewhat abandoned. So the HEM technique and the Karopolis technique are the two techniques which are most commonly used in today's environment. And this is where we would see the majority of our business. In the case of this material, this is the EFG technique. We don't, here at Insico, we don't do that much work with EFG. We do mostly, most of our work is done with the Karopolis technique or with the HEM technique. Can you tell us a little bit about the hardness of sapphire? It's very common for a lot of people to think sapphire would be on the Rockwell C scale. The Rockwell C scale is an indentation test, which means you take a stylus tip and you actually indent the surface. These materials are too brittle. If you try to indent, you will fracture the part. So when we talk about the hardness of these materials, we typically talk on what's called the MO scale, M-O-H. The most scale, the softest material is considered to be talc, and the hardest material is considered to be diamond. So sapphire is right below diamond. Typically that scale is from 0 to 10, with diamond being a 10. Sapphire would be a 9.7. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but it's very hard, so the only thing that you can really effectively do any machining in these materials is with diamond tools. You cannot use single point diamond turning, you cannot use a carbide cutter, you will just fracture the part. Does Insico have relationships with growers of all these materials? Yes, Insico is in a unique position because we do not grow any of these materials. We can select them based upon what we understand to be the end use technique and or 
sometimes it's selected for specifically only because that's the only way we can make a part to the size that's being requested. For example, the only area where you're going to get 20 inch diameter sapphire is going to be in the HEM technique. But please understand that that evolves. Uh, over the time that I've been here, over the last 30 years, this technique had become somewhat more apparent. Um, and some of these other, th this technique, certainly as I mentioned earlier, has basically gone obsolete. So this technique isn't even available anymore. We just have some remnant pieces in order to I, I like to show this part because what this part, a lot of people when they hear the Sikorsky, they think of single crystal silicon. It really is the same process, except in the case of the Sikorsky technique, it was started with an iridium crucible, and iridium is very expensive. And again, that was another reason why this had become obsolete. What are some of the features of different crystal orientations? That's a good question. The differences in the crystal orientations is usually a material property called anisotropy. And so in the case of sapphire as a material, this is a hexagonal rhombohedral structure. So this is a representation of the sapphire single crystal itself. And as you can see, it is longer than it is wide. And so what happens is, for example, in the case of this, this would be a zero degree orientation. But coefficient of thermal expansion is usually the best one to talk about in the instance of these pieces. So for example, if we would take a sapphire in a zero degree orientation, which means that that is the orientation of the part, this diameter is going to expand and contract uniformly because this is the most isotropic orientation that there is. If we would make this part in this orientation, we would see this expand and contract non-uniformly and that would cause problems with regards to a ceramic to metal seal or a sapphire to metal seal that might be put on the end of this piece. So anisotropy, dielectric constant, there's quite a few differences amongst these materials, uh, amongst sapphire based upon orientation. And I will tell you in my experience here, the most, con I will tell you in my experience here, one of the things which is very commonly misunderstood is that anisotropy. Because that anisotropy will control a lot of success or lack of success in the end use applications. Another example would be birefringents. So sapphire, when we would be doing a part, the least birefringent orientation would be parallel to the C-axis coming through the piece itself.